Welcome to From the Tailgate, where we talk sports and music. All the while, we sit up on the tailgate with the grill fired up and a cold adult snack in our hand. You know what I'm talking about. We are psyched for you to join us. So drop your tailgate and listen in as we bring in some great guests from the world of football, music, and pitmasters, helping your grill game and local brewers guiding us to the best local craft beers. All right, let's get to the show. Okay, y'all. Welcome to another episode of From the Tailgate. Today's show is going to be a blast. We have three great guests. First, we're going to start with our new friend, we'll call her for now. Um, her name is Shasta, and she'll be talking Patriots with us. Maybe one of the biggest Patriots fans I've met. Then we'll have on Matt Groark. Matt is a phenomenal barbecue guy. Huge following, great teacher, awesome to learn from. We're really excited to bring him out and have him on for you guys. And then last but not least, we have Dave Ritchie from 11 Design here in Rhode Island. He is the, with his family members, the creator of the movie Craft Rhode Island. It's a documentary. It's great. I guess we just have a lot of greatness today, so let's get to it. First, I'm going to bring in Shasta. We'll chat with her for a bit, and we'll go from there. And my guess is her name might change somewhere during the episode. Hey, Shasta. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you? Doing well, thanks. You ready to go? I'm ready. Okay. Okay. So again, I'd like to introduce, we're going to call her a friend from now of the show uh, and see where that takes us. But by the end of the show, we might even have a nickname for her. But for <laughs> now, this is Shasta, my favorite female Patriot fan out there. So we're going to talk some football today with her. We're, we're going to talk some tailgating and we're going to talk what happened two days ago with Gillette as it relates to fans being at the games so if you guys are ready we're ready Shasta you ready I'm ready okay so as some of you probably already know by now Gillette Stadium has made an announcement that their intentions are to only have the stadium at 20% of capacity for this year, which I thought was bad. That's an insane number. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I, I thought about myself as a season ticket holder. Not all ticket holders will be able to be there for all the games. So I can only imagine with the distancing that they'll require that I'll be up like in section 311 in the last row, like Bob Euchre or something. But uh it's going to be interesting to see how everything unfolds and we're going to get a little later into the show with one of our friends who's down in Jersey, who's a big Eagles fan and their situation. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Their situation is far worse, but I don't want to kill that joy. So uh, we'll get to that later. So your immediate response to this is what, what are you thinking? Well, I, I mean, 16,000 is not a lot of people in that stadium. And I think they could do better. I mean, even if we cut it at 50%, then at least you can still keep people separated, but not have it practically empty. I mean, what's the point of that? I guess the point is something is better than nothing. But I mean, I'll take it. I'll take it for sure. I mean, definitely better than nothing. The reality of the situation, Chasta, is that we all just don't know what's it's like it's six weeks away. What yeah. is six weeks from now going to look like every day I turn on the news, it looks different. Yeah. Whether it's true or not. Correct. Nobody knows. Yep. I, I've been saying since the jump with this, I just want somebody, some bean counter somewhere <laughs> who says every day, this is the amount of legitimate real cases this is the amount of hospitalizations. 
intensive care, and unfortunate deaths. Well, I think the NBA is being kind of a sounding board for this because so many players are showing up positive, which is planting seeds and fear for the NFL players going into it. But it's the same percentage as the people who are being tested. I would agree. I would agree with that. But I think just because if we're just talking about teams and about the community of the NFL, it's like having, you know, going off of a small little town and it's just kind of starting to spread. Right. So my thought on that is, let's assume that it's true that this group of, I believe it's 32 players and coaches and NBA folks Mm -hmm. tested positive. They're going to live in this bubble. They're going to be in isolation until they're not testing positive two consecutive days, I believe, for COVID. And then they're going to be allowed back out. What a better test for what's going on than that. Yeah. And then by the time that we're really start playing, which I guess is about a week and a half away now, um, hopefully we have some real strong answers as to what's going to happen with these athletes. Now, the NFL is a whole different beast. And I know that they've come out with a new mask shield for the helmets and everything. Yeah. But the level of contact you have with each other is, uh, well, it's full contact football. Let's call it like it is. We're not going to play flag football. Right. Uh, So it's going to be interesting to see. The dynamic is going to change in that people are still, teams are still going to travel. Yeah. So that's. You know, how do we how do we protect these teams when they travel? And listen, I'm sure the NFL has got a great plan, but it's just kind of daunting for us as fans to be sitting here. I'm going to just say what everybody's thinking. We're all (laughs) praying that there's football one way or another. Right. So that's the first thing I want there to be football. Stadium's got to be empty. Let it be empty. Yeah. Worst case, worst case scenario. Right. Well, worst case scenario is no football season, which I don't. The United States of America is ready to handle, quite Mm -hmm. frankly. I think tensions are running high in all different categories. And one of the things that really brings the country together is sports. And I think we're going to see that here in the next few weeks with baseball and basketball, presuming that everything goes as planned. But that brings me to my next point. We had some pretty big news in New England over the last couple of weeks with a fellow named Cam Newton. I, I love I'm, that news. I'm excited about this. I'm really excited. Different. It's great newsworthy stuff. It gives us a lot of stuff to talk about. Mm-hmm. But if there's anybody, as far as I'm concerned, that needs, for lack of a better word here, a second shot, it's this guy. Absolutely. It was five minutes ago that he was in a Super Bowl and winning an MVPs. Yeah, he, I think he has really kind of gotten the, the short end of the stick on um, the end of his career and for sure with the Panthers. I was, did you watch the roundtable with him and Odell and Gurley I at did. all? Absolutely. How could you not? It was just fascinating. Well, and to be basically told, you know, you've given up nine years and, you know, in a text and you can hit the road was just like, wow, I had no idea. Yeah, that, that dog don't hunt as far as I'm concerned. I don't, yeah, I it's awful. Better. And I think, frankly, he's one of the people who's been affected most by COVID and everything with Corona because he couldn't get out and prove his abilities to these teams. They're right. been down. Now, the Patriots, in typical Patriot form, signed him on a flyer for, you know, a bag of uh, footballs and uh, <laughs> two kicking tees. And some gum that matches a Patriot uniform. Exactly. But he's making less than, I want to say when I looked, 28 of the backups in the NFL. Which is crazy. It makes no sense to me. Now, Jameis Winston down with New Orleans said, I want to learn and all the right things you're supposed to say. But that dude threw for 5,000 yards one season as well, and he's not making the money. So I think that this is – it's interesting to me that when you look at an organization like the Patriots 
and you look at an organization like the Saints, they're always one smart decision ahead in most cases. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they get a bloody nose, you know, Ocho Cinco. Um, <laughs> and a home run, Randy Moss. Yeah. I think in this particular case, if Lord is willing and we have a football season, it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see the minds of the Patriots coaching staff combined with the athletic ability of Cam. Well, his that interview was funny to me because he called out McDaniels, which has been my biggest gripe. It's, you know, he called him out and was like, well, what are you going to have ready for me? You know, how are you going to handle me? How, what are you going to do with a quarterback that can haul ass down the field? Right. I, I don't know that he was calling him out, but he was reminding him subtly. There's been a lot of stink in social media and everything over the last 48 hours, as you know, about, you know, oh, Cam said this, blah, 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 Brady, blah, 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 blah. I don't think he could have said it any better. No, I don't think so either. Listen, he, Tom Brady's Tom Brady. He owns New England. I don't care where he's getting the ball snapped to him right now, but New England is Tom Brady. Yes. And that's great. And I thought that Cam addressed, as he called it, the elephant in the room as best he could. But he wasn't going to eat a complete meal of humble pie sitting there with those guys. No and he way. said, don't forget, I got a skill set too here. Yeah, and I think and I think he's ready. I think that dude has the biggest chip on his shoulder of any guy in the NFL right now. I love it. It's going to be a great story, isn't it? It is going to be awesome. I'm I'm here for it. I'm ready. And think- not to mention he's, you know, 65 what? Well, they have him listed at 245, but I guarantee you he's put on 15 pounds of new muscle. He looks like a beast, no doubt about it. Huge. I- I'll tell you where I really noticed the size was when he was throwing the ball with and kill Harry and mm-hmm. he, like a little child. And he's <laughs> big. <laughs> oh, I know it was insane. So uh, one thing we know for sure, the guy is in shape. Now, is he football ready? We're going to find out Lord willing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so I'm excited. I am a little bummed. We won't have any preseason, which I think would be good, but uh, I understand it. I hate the preseason. Well, I hate it too. But in our situation right now, I mean, we hate it because we've had the same quarterback for 20 years. But right now with Cam, I think it would be beneficial for him to be able to get out there early and kind of, you know, get moving and see how he's feeling the plays and everything. And we're not going to have that. So it's all going to be blindly going into game one. Right. And I don't have the numbers here in front of me, but I do understand that they're going to allow the camp to be bigger more more guys are going to be able to be invited to camp. So they'll so Belichick and company will find a way to put him in those environments um, that simulate that. Let's face it, if he played the preseason, he wasn't going to play more than one or two, you know, deals. Because yeah. I bid him is still going to be the long term vision. Because what's going to happen this year, in my opinion is let's let's assume that you and I are right and he has a great year. He's not staying here for the amount of money that we paid him. He's gonna, Well, no, we'd have to pay him eventually, and that means making a decision, right? Right, and he'd get bags. I mean bags of money. And I'd take it if I were him based on what happened in Carolina. Yeah. And I'd shove it where the sun don't shine. But you still got Stidham sitting there that you used that pick on and has been professed to be nothing short of way ahead of of schedule. So you're right. There's some big decisions. But the worst case scenario, the best case scenario is we have to make those decisions. And he had a great year. The worst case scenario is he's a bust and Stidham's playing in week seven. Um. I don't see that happening, but it's out there. Yeah. Regardless. Yeah, and, well, and there's a little bit of comfort just in case, you know, knock on wood, that anything were to happen, Stidham could step in. Absolutely. I, I think they're in a great situation. I think, again, 
Like I would love to have just seen the faces of the GMs in Miami and Buffalo and the Jets when they heard. Oh, the- oh my gosh! Yeah, jaws on the floor. And then They're when like, they, why don't- can't we? Why can't we just have them in the toilet for once? Yeah, and and the funny part about the whole thing is on the on the team friendly deal that he came in on is any of those teams could have pulled this off, but the Patriots did. And that just seems to be a recurring theme. They seem to just have that one extra move. I mean, we were all sitting up here. Let's face it. Let's be honest. We're all in Stidham's corner. We're all rooting for him. We're all hoping for the best. I was hoping for an eight and eight, nine and seven. Now I look at the situation and I think, you know, if the rainbow and the rain pours at the same time and it lines itself just right, how cool would it be to see Brady make it into the playoffs and Cam and the Patriots making it into the playoffs? It would be- That's the dream. That would be the ultimate Super Bowl to beat Brady at his new home. I was just tweeting about that. <laughs> and I say, I stay home very weekly because, no, it's not home, but. I get it. Yep. That would be the ultimate goal. Yes. I, I, and, and for him, it's home right now. Well, he's living in Derek Jeter's house. So, uh, yuck. Call that. (laughs) It's kind of weird to me. He could have a hex on him, you know, after living in that house. (laughs) Well, after he went in the neighbor's house and the coach and all the funny. It's just classic Brady, no doubt. Yeah, and we also don't know what Brady's going to look like playing in that Florida weather either. It's a huge climate change. He'll be fine. Listen, he made through 20 years here playing at Gillette and thrived. That's because he turned into a cold weather creature. I think that he's... That tan comes on real quick and easy for him. I don't think Giselle keeps him in the cold weather too long. I think he'll be probably fun. not. <laughs> you know, because we all know who really makes the decisions in that relationship. That's true. So that's uh, true. But I'm still going to hope that our team as a whole at least whoops on the Bucks a little bit. Yeah, we for can't, sure. We can't let Brady leave and win at all. Uh, Although I wouldn't be sad. Let's just say that. I love the boy. I I would love for him to have seven because I know that's what he wants. So my attitude, and this kind of evolved over the last five days, is I was really struggling with it because you can't root for somebody like Tom Brady for 20 years and then just turn it off or Gronk for nine years and then just turn it off and not want to see them succeed. Exactly. Exactly. So I came up with a deal with myself. I went online and I went to TB12 and I bought a TB12 hat. Good compromise. Yep. And I'm allowed to wear that in my mind, my feeble little. (laughs) I'm allowed to wear that any day, but game day. That's a good plan. It's Patriots gear or it's from the tailgate gear, but it will never be TB12. And I, damn sure I'm not putting one of those ugly Buccaneers hats on. Oh, hell no. 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 Do you know that I, do you know that I have a standing rule that I never wear a Patriots jersey on game day? I did not know that. Yes, because I always felt like on game day, the only people that should be wearing jerseys are the players. Otherwise, it's bad luck. Thank you. My theory is the same, but different. I stopped playing football Geez, 25 years ago now. And the last time I took my jersey on, it had my name on the back of it. And I've not worn a jersey since then. I just, it doesn't feel right to me to wear somebody other, some other guy's name on my back. And maybe yeah, that, if you were a player, I could see that being kind of weird. It's just my ego didn't allow for it. I ran my course. I enjoyed my career through college, getting cut after that, but I just can't do it. I I can't, I won't, and I damn sure won't spend a hundred bucks for one. Now, everybody else, I'm cool with it. Have a ball, buy as many jerseys as you want, wear them all the time. I just can't do it. I got t-shirts, I got hats, scarves, stickers, you name it, I got it, but I'm not wearing a jersey. 
That makes sense. That's fair. That's, That's fair. They do spend a lot of money on gear as fans. That's for sure. I only have one jersey, and it's Brady's. Well, I, if I was going to pick one, uh, it would either be him or Brewski. So I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, that's enough talking about jerseys and when we wear <laughs> when we don't wear them. Um, if anybody hasn't caught on to our new friend of the show's name is Shasta. So her and I met kind of long distance, and we've been talking back and forth on a regular basis via show, social media. We had a lot in common. Everybody knows I love the show Yellowstone. She loves Yellowstone. We're both huge Patriots fans, both big Brady fans, et cetera, et cetera. So I had the guys in who, when we're all done doing this talking, clean up everything, record, they do the videos, all that stuff. And I shared with them that I was having you on today. So this one guy, he looks at me and he goes, well, we can't call her Shasta. I go, (laughs) well, why not? I said, it's a great story. It's named after a mountain where she was conceived by her parents. It seems cool to me. He goes, because. I grew up loving Shasta root beer. So from this moment on, she's root beer. <laughs> so folks. Seems accurate. Are, so I'd like to officially announce that uh, as it relates to our show, not her family or husband, <laughs> um, which has some serious issues as it relates to choosing jerseys and things. like that. <laughs> but on the show and on social media, she will be root beer. Okay. <laughs> It'll probably get abbreviated to RB at some point, but it's happening. It's happening. Let it be known. And Mike, who also puts together the tailgates, which we're going to talk a little bit about right now, has also said that if things develop and she becomes a permanent friend on the show, that we'll have to have root beer at all of the tailgates. Absolutely. So that means we'll have water, because you got to have water, craft beer from some cool place here in New England, and root beer. Sign good. Up for- I'll be there. Yep, you got to sign up for one of those. <laughs> so I've been mentally constipated about everything that's going on and what's going to happen with tailgating, given the circumstances. And they're bleak, to be candid with you. You know, uh, if there's 16,000 people allowed in the stadium at Gillette, how many people are going to be allowed in the parking lot? Yeah. So will Tesla look like it normally does? Will tailgating become bigger because less people can go in? Now, as it relates to our show and our set, We'll be back on regular radio as well as doing our podcasts because we've really grown to like those. Um, And we'll make that announcement here in a few weeks about stations and all that good stuff. But we've secured a spot directly across from the stadium. And for folks that have been there a lot, you know where I'm talking about on the other side of Route 1 there. um, That won't have to play by the NFL rules, for lack of a better way to put this. But then we have. Yeah, you can avoid the liability. Right. We have Massachusetts where they could come in and shut down those areas. Um, So we just don't know. So here's the one thing I'm telling our listeners whether it be you're listening on social media, on Spotify, Apple, you name it. If there's an NFL season, we're going to tailgate. We just don't know what it's going to look like. I met with a brewery yesterday, Uh, really cool guys. Um, They've become friends of the show. And we talked about having a 20 by 20 foot blow up big screen. And they have a ginormous, huge open area. So we could still adhere to all the rules, but yet be in a communal place, which is what most folks that like football like to do. Yeah, watch it together. That's a great idea. You know, we'll have great craft beer. Uh, We'll bring in some of our barbecue friends and we'll cook. You know, know, we're going to do whatever we can to make this as good as possible. So right now, all I'm praying for is that we have an NFL season. 
Everything after that, we'll figure out. Well, I wonder how much longer they're going to drag it out because we're all waiting. I, I think the NFL is really watching closely what's, what's going to happen with baseball and the NBA. Yeah. Because if we get shut down during them, it's on them. If we get shut down during the NFL season, the NFL's in, in line with them to get a black guy. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. Yeah, for sure. Well, hopefully they make their decision pretty soon. Sure would be nice to have a plan. Well, I don't want to do a complete killjoy of Matt Groark, who's joining the show after this, but we had to record his session first. Um, the Eagles have already said that n- there'll be no fans at the games. For their stadium? Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, I honestly, I, like I, I told you yesterday when I talked to you, I, I wouldn't put it past our governor either, Inslee, for Seattle to make that the same. I mean, he's been yeah. pretty hardcore out here which is such a bummer because I've been waiting for this game. I can't even tell you forever, ever, ever. Well, you already know I have two tickets to get out there, so I'll be real disappointed uh, yeah. if it happened. But it is what it is. And at the end of the day, those lives are in the balance on this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Depends on who you believe. Some folks are saying it's, it's in the state of Texas, it's 12th behind 11 other flu seasons. And then you've got other folks saying this is the real deal and this could get real bad. So I stick my feather in one particular cap. The bottom line is at the beginning of flu season, you can go get a flu shot. And that reduces your risk significantly to getting the flu. Right. We have nothing as it relates to this thing. We have some optimism, some hope, So I get how cautious everybody's being. You know, one stadium full of people where half of them or even 10%, think about that, 6,500, 7,000 people contracted this thing. That's a lot of folks going back into a whole bunch of other communities. Absolutely. So while I selfishly, and I mean selfishly, I want stadium packed. I want football to be normal. Uh, I understand the precautions that are going on and uh, we here at the show are going to play it out just like them, except we're going to be one step behind them on every decision they make. That's all you can do. Really? uh, We'll talk about root beer. We'll talk (laughs) about what we think is going to happen. Good and bad uh, until we know something for sure. Yeah. In the meantime, I do have one question I've really never posed to you. Okay. How's that, how, how are your cooking skills? I can actually cook really well. And are I can you, even uh, grill pretty good, but um, I prefer to stay at the stove. So does hubby grill and you cook indoors, or is grilling not a huge part of what you guys do? How's that all roll out? He grills, and I micromanage him. <laughs> Well, that's marriage, right? I don't micromanage. He's kind of one of the ones that, you know, doesn't grill at all until summer. And then he kind of loses his touch. So it takes him a good, like, four rounds to get his touch back. Oh, I'm going to have to have some sidebar conversations with him and get him religious again. I know. And I told you how I feel about the Traeger because he bought a Traeger. And that is the most annoying piece of equipment I've ever had in my life. I I like the Traeger and I like pellet grills in general, um, but it's a different cook and making your food uh, on a Traeger is different than on real wood and, and coals for that matter. I'm a wood and coals guy, but I, I, I love the idea of a Traeger because you come home from work, you press one button and then you go in the house, get a beer, check in with the family and you go back outside and you're at the exact temperature you're supposed to be. Whereas with grills or wood, you've got to build your fire and sometimes that's a half hour. Sometimes it's two minutes. You know, it just Okay, depends. you made that Traeger sound way easier than it is. Uh, well, it, to me, there's no one button push. There's a lot of babysitting. It takes forever. I mean, you can't just come home and, 
and cook something quick. It's like a process, right? Well, I don't know a lot about a lot, but I know how to use a Traeger or a I need a lesson. So uh, I'm going to volunteer that to you. The next time we're using our pellet grill, which is not a Traeger here, by the way, um, but works on the same principles, I'm going to do a video. And then I'm going to send the video out to everybody. And, and we're just going to name the video Root Beer. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> That's going to be a project. This week we're doing all Goya foods. Um, nice. Because I don't like that people's companies are being leveraged by politics. I think it's poison. Yeah. So we, I, I literally went to a local grocer up here in the area and they had a whole row. You might've seen it on the social media. They had a whole row of Goya products. And I filled the carriage half with them and came back and said, I'm a cook with all this stuff this week. Cause good for you. Don't tell me who, who I should buy food from and who I shouldn't buy based on politics. Yeah. I, I, you know, I grew up the church and state were separate from each other and it, it really feels and looks and tastes like nothing separate from each other in this instantaneous world of social media. So this week we're going to do the Goya video and then next week we'll do the root beer video. How's it sound? Sounds good. I need all the help I can get. If I could figure it out, I probably would love it. That's what people tell me. I, I agree with you. So maybe we'll do a zoom and you can just ask us questions as we're doing it. And then you'll be a, a pellet grill girl. Perfect. Sounds good to me too. I'll be a hero. Well, we got to go get some other folks on the show now, pay some bills with those good commercials and uh, get on down the road. But it's been great. Enjoyed this first go round with root beer. And uh, I look forward to doing it again. Great. Thanks for having me on. It was a blast. Thanks. Bye. Hey, that was a lot of fun like to thank Shasta for joining us, or as she is now affectionately called, Root Beer. Our next guest, Matt Groark, is a teacher by day and a barbecue guy by night. And why I bring that up specifically is because he's amazing at teaching you in short periods of time how to improve your grill game. So we're excited to have him on here and give us a little bit of info about him and, and maybe learn something today, which is better than when I'm talking to you guys. So without further ado, welcome in, Matt. So what's it like being married to a vegetarian? <laughs> you know what, man, we've, uh, we've been married for seven years. I've, you know, I've known her my whole life. Almost. We, we went to school, you know, middle school together and, um, graduated high school together. And then, you know, went our separate ways, we kind of were mutual, you know, a lot of mutual friends. So we kind of always known her. Um, she's been vegetarian since she was 12. So it's not like she met me and it was a sudden transition. You know, we've, we've been started dating 10, 12 years ago and married seven years, two kids. So it's not like it's even, you know, an issue when she cooks she just makes herself some funky ass vegetarian you know vegan meat <laughs> i just can't do it but i yeah you, you said she at 12 years old this started when yeah. my daughter came home to me at 12 years old and she said to me daddy i'm never eating anything with a face on it again yeah <laughs> I, I was like okay this is one of those twelve-year-old things; it'll go away. Yeah, five now and still has not eaten something with a face on it. Yeah, yep. It's unbelievable. I, I think with Kristen, it's it's like it was um, it was never a. I mean, not not to say never because she like you know the way I guess some animals are treated and stuff like impacts her a little bit, but that's not why it all started. You know, it was, uh, she tells me back when she was like 12, it was Thanksgiving and her mom was like, you know, pre prepping a Turkey for, for cooking and like pulled all the innards and all that stuff out. And it just came pouring out of the, the Turkey and she just kind of gagged and never touched meat after that. 
Oh, that's a classic story. <laughs> yeah, so it was just one of those things, you know. We uh, brought her to that decision. Yeah, but she'll she'll handle it, you know. She'll cook it. She doesn't have like any issue about it. If she's making meatballs, like she'll have me mix up all the meatball mix because it just skeeves her out. But you know, mushing it all together. But you know, she'll make a tofu loaf when she makes me meatloaf. You know. <laughs> I'm just gonna pass on that that thought. Right yeah, now. yeah. We um, have Taco Tuesday. She makes, uh, you know, she uses black beans or refried beans, or she uses, you know, the little crumble, you know, tofu crumble stuff that they sell in the stores. Right. So I got to ask the first question of all. Both of us. I, I was born and raised in New Jersey, off to college in Philadelphia. Now living. Oh, okay. How did you end up being a barbecue guy in Jersey? You know what? I, I think I always had, always had like through school. I've, first off, I worked in the restaurant industry like since I was 16. You know, like my first, my first job was, was at Woodbury Country Club back in the day when it used to be there. Um, you know, golf course and country club and like a banquet hall. And I, I, I started at 16 there because my sister was a waitress and I was washing dishes at 16 and um, went from washing dishes to like prep cooking, you know, helping chop, chop, you know, onions and tomatoes and prepping stuff for the chef. And then next thing I knew a year later or so, I ended up on the line with the chef kind of just helping him, helping with stuff. So I always... You know, and then I went to serving and, you know, all through high school and, you know, college and into my 20s and even early 30s was waiting tables in restaurants, you know. And so I've always been around a kitchen and food and out of high school, I wanted to go to culinary school it was kind of my goal. I wasn't the best student. So, you know, I, I kind of was that kid that never got in trouble or anything. But, you know, I. I kept my grades where they needed to be in order for me to play sports, you know? Um, and I played ball in college for a couple of years and that was really my focus. And, um, you know, just the, the cooking thing, the culinary thing didn't work out. You know, specifically that chef that I worked with had kind of told me one time that if I really want to be a chef, I need to think long and hard about it in terms of if I have a family and be around my kids a lot and be with my family he said because if you're a chef on holidays you're not you're not spending holidays with your family you're cooking for other families um interesting point that i hadn't really thought of yeah because you know most restaurants don't close down on holidays you know for the most part there's there's one business and if you're a chef especially if you own a restaurant um you know, or you're an executive chef, you're, you're there cooking, prepping, doing all that for other families. They go out during the holidays. Think about Mother's Day. Think about Father's Day. Think about, you know, not not the holidays like Christmas. Obviously, that's at home in most cases. But the little ones that really mean a lot, you know, um, that you would you would be gone. Um, so that 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 that's he hit me. Um, cause I knew that where I'm at now is what I wanted in terms of family and kids. So, um, ended up teaching and then, uh, you know, I've always grilled in my backyard. I've always been an outdoor kind of, you know, cooking type of, you know, grill dad type of type of guy and being an Eagles season ticket holder for so long and tailgates and grilling have been a huge part of, you know, me, my dad and my brother's. Um, you know, social life. So I always loved it. And then, uh, you know, about four years ago, my wife's uh, stepfather came home. We had dogs sat for the weekend for them. And when they came home to pick up the dogs from us, he had, I guess he had ordered a smoker like months and months ago and it got delivered and he never even opened it. It was just a, you know, $160 master bill you know propane smoker and he dropped it in my kitchen and was like here thanks for you know watching the dogs i ordered this and never used it and you know maybe you can use it and he can bear some fruit from it you know and uh shoot you take that to, i think he dropped that off on like a sunday uh, like saturday afternoon and sunday morning i had some 
chicken legs, pork butt. Like I went right out to the store, bought some meat and had never really done it before and just freaking throw some, threw some meat on the, on the smoker. <laughs> and that, you know, the rest is kind of history. It just kind of kept, I kept rolling with it. And then social media became a big part of it. And I started posting and, um, you know, over time I had a lot of friends and family. I noticed that as I was cooking more, I had more people come around (laughs) and like, you know, and it's not to sound like a certain way, but like really food does bring people together. Um, you know, it's not like I didn't see these people anyway. It's just some more gatherings happened and people would hit me up like, Hey, I'm having my kid's birthday party. You think you could, you know, throw me together some stuff. And, um, I went ahead and started doing that and I was just charging people, you know, cost because I love doing it. And then it got to a point where some people said, listen, just, you know, my friends would, if I told you it cost a hundred bucks for me to go get the food and cook it, they would throw me another hundred just to say, thanks, you know, got, gotcha. Like this and these- I think we have to dip into the social media part of it since that's how I came across you. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I can surmise how I got into the barbecue part of tailgating in, in one brief sentence. I worked in Texas for four years. There you go. <laughs> I went there thinking I could cook on the grill. Dad grilling, as you put it, was a perfect way to put it. And right. I came back to New England revigorated with a whole different education. It is insane down there. Uh, oh, I can't even imagine. It's every. It's like up here at Dunkin' Donuts. Down there, there's a barbecue place on every corner. Yeah. <laughs> so you you got to get your game. And, and luckily, with the sports side of my career down there, I was able to meet a lot of great pit masters from Mode on down. Right. And it just got, it got in me. And I never thought, boy, cooking's what I want to do. But now, I don't even want to go out to dinner anymore. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Why do I want to pay a hundred dollars somewhere for a steak? It's yeah. not half as good as what we could do at home. Nope. So uh, it, it it's been an interesting evolution. So when we came up here with everything that went on with COVID, uh, terrestrial radio got postponed till the end of August for me. And but we said let's try podcast stuff. Yeah. And if you're going to do podcast, though, you got to get into this social media deal. Of course. So. I've always been a Twitter guy. We've got a good Twitter following. We're just started with Instagram. And somebody says to me, all right, you got to check out this TikTok thing. <laughs> I'm like, what? TikTok, you know, you got to try TikTok. So I, I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. Our daughters were laughing at me, but I didn't of know. Of course. Yeah. So I go on there and I'm not exaggerating. The fourth thing that comes up is you. <laughs> Talking about don't wash your chicken. <laughs> yeah. It was insane. I, I scrolled back up to it like 10 times laughing because I never, ever washed the chicken. I couldn't understand why people did it because you just. Why people do. Yeah. In my. Yep. So tell me, how did that all start? Because to me, that was like the thing that grabbed me about you is the story about washing chicken. Yeah. So I, I mean, I did the whole Instagram thing and I'm on Twitter. I'm a teacher. So this barbecue thing is kind of just a side hustle right. that turned into a little bit more than that. Um, Are you being-, at, being a high school teacher, that's, you know, my passion. That's what I do. And I, I've always kind of led with the fact that everything I do on social media is teaching as well. So because that's what I'm best at. I can cook, I can barbecue, but what I'm truly best at is communicating as a presence online to be able to hopefully teach people, you know, a thing or two. And I'll never say that I know it all. I'm, I learn every, every time I scroll through TikTok, I'm learning something from some awesome cook that's on TikTok. And that's, what's so cool about it. Um, I have, I have 500,000 followers, but I scroll through pages and pages and i see people that have two thousand followers just and i'm like wow how did they not have a million you know um and that's kind of how it all that's that's where the the kind of passion of it happened is it's all teaching to me so 
you know, I, I did the Instagram thing. And then, it, like you mentioned, your daughter, you know, I'm, I'm a high school teacher. I teach anywhere from 15, 14 to 18 year olds. So I have a little advantage in terms of the social media thing because I'm always ahead of the curve, you know, yep. kind of like kind of like music. You know, I might be in my house singing a song in my in my head and my sister, my, uh, you know, wife's like, wait, what, what is that song? And I'm like, oh, well, it's the, the hottest new, you know, <laughs> hip hop or rap or whatever, because high school kids are always on top of things. And they were all on TikTok before anybody was. And, you know, I had an opportunity through a good friend of mine who's also on TikTok from North Jersey. Her name is T. Um Tara Al Dente Diva on TikTok. Um, and she was on TikTok. She was on TikTok right before I was, and we were both on Instagram. So she got me to go on TikTok and start posting. And we were both part of TikTok's very early creator program, where we were required to post a certain amount of posts every month. And we started to both gain a following and um you know, it kind of went from there. And then, you know, long story short, I just kept posting. I mean, people think that I blew up overnight on TikTok. I've been posting on TikTok for two years now. You know, it wasn't something like I went on and just blew up. Like I've been, wor- it's, it's a lot of work. I've, and I, I've posted it, it, 800 it, it, videos to get to where I'm at, you know. Yep. Um, Social that's, media. That's, work. Eight, that's 800 different cooks, you know. Yep. Um, you think about it. So started doing that. And then the whole washing chicken thing was just funny. Like I've always been taught. I've always known not to wash your chicken because, you know, think of when someone sneezes and covers their mouth. And I know that everyone has seen those slow motion videos (laughs) and you know what it looks like in slow motion when someone sneezes. Absolutely. They Oh, cover your mouth. Yeah, go ahead. Cover your mouth. It doesn't matter. You're still sneezing all over people um, because there's so many little particles of of spit going everywhere. Same thing washing your chicken. And I did a video where I did slow it down. And you can see my hand, the water hitting my hand as if I was washing my hands. You know, imagine my hand is a piece of chicken and you have these little droplets of water going 10 feet. In your kitchen, hitting your cabinets, hitting your, and people don't think that, Um, you know, so you talk about salmonella and bacteria, you're spreading it all over your kitchen (laughs) when you do that. So I kind of did it as a joke initially. Like, I think someone was washing their chicken with like Dawn soap or something being silly. And I duetted it. And I, and I (laughs) said, it just became a thing. Um, And people kind of tagged me as the don't wash your chicken guy on TikTok, And, uh, you know, that kind of blew up and I just kind of, you know, I I don't care if people wash their chicken or, you know, facts are science is science and, you know, you shouldn't wash your chicken, period. (laughs) Nothing you do. I get people ask me all the time and they're like, why? And the best answer I give people is why exactly? Why are you washing your chicken? You, You are not cleaning anything off of that chicken that cooking it isn't going to do like you cook your chicken properly. It's going to kill all bacteria that, that is on the chicken. That's it. And, you know, so it became kind of a fun thing. And I've posted a bunch of videos that were kind of more comedy than, you know, anything holding up a sign that says, don't wash your chicken, you know, like that, but it's, it's fun. And that's the fun side of TikTok, you know, it really, it really is. And it's, it's a, a addictive like Big you'll go on and, and hit one thing, and the next thing you know, it's 45 minutes is gone. Yeah, it's the truth. It, it's it, We're the attention span of a gnat at this point. <laughs> Which is why quick. TikTok's so, so successful. Absolutely. You know? So earlier on, you brought up your passion for tailgating. Tailgating in Philadelphia is crazy. Nuts. Yeah. Absolutely. That town is insane. When I was in college, I worked at what was this It's no longer there, the spectrum. And uh, to say fans in Philadelphia are rabid, you know, we all know the Santa Claus getting snowballed story. Yep. I can just imagine tailgating 
outside of an Eagles game and being, I don't know, a Patriots fan. Yeah. Well, how about how about being a Redskins fan and a professional basketball player for the Philadelphia 76ers that walks through a tailgate and you end up in a fist fight like <laughs> like like Mike Scott? <laughs> You're one of the most beloved Sixers players yep. because of your grit and toughness and attitude. And then you get in a literal fist fight with fans because you're walking through the tailgate in a Redskins jersey. And, and which, he's, not, he's not the target you want to pick on. No, he's six eight, <laughs> and he's tatted on his neck. Like you don't mess with people with tats on their necks. No, um, you know. And what's crazy, Cliff, is um, the group of guys that were tailgating that got into that scrum with Mike Scott. Um, I was there. Uh, I actually got in between the guy swinging and Mike Scott. I got up on Mike Scott's chest and was yelling at him, like, back up, back up. We're good. They're good. They're good. Stay away. You don't want to do this. Like, you know, and I was pushing him up his defense, and he was obviously letting me push him back because I certainly wouldn't be able to stop him. But he had other guys, and I eventually got him to the back fence away from full of his security guys and um he was you know he was like i'm good i'm good and he he uh, this is how cool mike scott is he looked when it was all calmed down and he was breathing heavy and all this and he looks down you want a selfie like and i've I, he took a <laughs> selfie with me and he was like we're good man so that group of guys actually hired me to cook a hog for them <laughs> That yeah, tailgate group. Saved them from getting killed by Mike Scott. So right. They- so <laughs> I was cooking a whole hog on my smoker and my trailer. And, you know, my young brother and my dad were there. And I was on Twitter all day. Like, yo, swing by the tailgate. Let's go. Come by K-Lot, you know. And sure enough, he did. And the bozos that I was cooking for, well, first, drunk. And didn't know who it was all they saw was this redskins jersey and they had a coffin that they tailgate and they put a t-shirt of whatever team you know and they do a whole you know funeral procession type thing it's really creative and really but talk about taking it too far i mean it's one of those moments that gives philly a bad name you know a bad or a good name. I, I clearly yeah. they're, yeah. they're they're over the top. Yeah, but uh, being up here in New England, we're not without our uh, oh knuckle. For sure. That's for sure. Every uh, well, listen, it's been great having you on. We'd love to have you on again. Awesome. Talk more tailgating. I knew we. I know we threw the gauntlet down to you guys when you said you wanted to tailgate everywhere to come up here. We've got a huge spot here at Gillette Stadium. Awesome. But, I would love it. Once all this clears up, man, I would love to, to make a trip. And that's, the, and that's the big question right now. I don't know what you guys are hearing down there, but yesterday they announced that Gillette is only going to be filled to 20% of capacity. Uh, they just announced, they announced two days ago that um, Eagles, Phillies are going to play games with zero fans. Oh, so they went even further than here. Zero. No one. So the question is, do you go tailgate at the stadium? And I don't even things? think I don't even think they're going to allow tailgating. I think the, the parking lots are all going to be shut down. I don't think they're even going to allow it. That's it's, that's it's, that that's my opinion. And you're probably right, and it's probably smart. Yeah, but man, it sucks. It sucks. It sucks big time. We're we we had season tickets, and we, you know, the Eagles last week sent out an email with giving you the option to defer and literally pause your contract for season tickets, which we did because I had a feeling this was going to come this way. So, yeah, we'll look forward to next season at this point. I honestly don't think the season's even going to happen. It, it's just uh, every time you there's a little breath that you think this thing is going to yeah. run its course. Something comes up. It's gone and something else yep. comes up. So I hope you're wrong. <laughs> Me too. So I'm not gonna wash my chicken. <laughs> do your part. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do my part. 
uh, and we'll check in down the road with you. It's been great having you on. For sure, you Cliff. Real quickly, remind all our listeners where they can find you. I know you're on TikTok and all that stuff, Matt, but yeah. where specifically can they catch up with you? Yeah, it's all the same. I'm at Grork Boys Barbecue, G-R-O-A-R-K, Boys BBQ. Um, I'm that same handle on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, um, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, you know, wherever you get your social media, that's where you can find me. Same, same handle. And to our listeners, we'll post all that stuff up. So For sure. Know. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to having a good Jersey guy back on to talk barbecue down the road. Thanks uh, for joining. I'd love it, Cliff. Take care, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. See ya. Last but not least, we are joined by Dave Ritchie. Dave Ritchie and his family are the creators of Craft Rhode Island. It's a documentary. In fact, it's an award-winning documentary that's out there now for everybody to view on a bunch of streaming facilities. We'll let him get into which ones. And uh, let's get him in here. Dave, welcome to the show. We are joined by Dave Ritchie. Dave of recent documentary craft beer fame here in new england dave why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about the movie uh where you can get it all that good stuff and and how it kind of came into being yeah again thanks for having me on your show um so i'm dave ritchie from 11 design llc we're a media and marketing production firm in providence rhode island uh i own the company with my uh brother sister and brother-in-law so um the movie was was done by the four of us uh the movie is uh, is called the craft rhode island um or the craft ri it premiered at the 2019 rhode island international film festival uh, i think our premiere was august 10th um of last year, almost a year ago uh, thankfully it was pre-pandemic and um it's actually our first uh, our first film. It's a feature length documentary. It runs you about an hour and four minutes long, um, and uh, so we had a great turnout at, at the world premiere. You know, obviously there's a lot of folks around the country that are really into craft beer. Long story short, we ended up uh, taking home a grand prize at that festival, which is really unbelievable because it's an Oscar qualifying festival. Not in the category that we won, uh, but but uh, a couple of the films that. Uh, that that were there. Um, actually, one of them was a finalist uh, for for an Oscar this year, and um, so we took home a grand prize. And um, after that, we picked up an agent, um, picked up a distribution company uh, out in Portland, Oregon, called KDMG. Uh, our agency is called Talk Global Media, and uh, and then our film just went nationwide uh, two weeks ago today. If uh, if today is Thursday, which I think it is, uh, the the film Heart went nationwide. Hey, buddy, what's that? It's hard to tell these days. It is they... hard to tell. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm home with, uh, I'm a school teacher, actually, uh, as well, a social studies teacher in Providence. And uh, so I've been home since March with a, a three-year-old and a two-year-old. And, um, and so I literally don't know what day it is, what time it is, what year it is, or anything like that. Uh, but the good news is that a lot of people are in our situation. And um, if you're, you know, looking for something to do, they can check out the Craft RI. Um, it's streaming across the country. So Folks will want to go on our website, thecraftri.com, to see a full list of, of viewing platforms. But around here in New England, um, they can check it out on Amazon Prime, um, Cox, Comcast, and Verizon Fios. Those are really the ones that I generally lead people to. Um, but if they're out in California or Texas or a place like that, they, they can find viewing options on our website, thecraftri.com. So when you started this, you really weren't a craft beer aficionado if, if i remember the story correctly that that would be that'd be accurate yeah as, as we were you know discussing before um you know i i certainly like beer. i sound like brett cavanaugh now i like beer um but i was not a you know a hop head a craft beer dork so to speak you know obviously as i just said i'm a i'm a history teacher and i have a master's in political science so my background is really in research um the rest of my team uh, has really the artistry behind them. And so we were doing some work for, uh, I can say it now, we were doing some work for Rhode Island PBS, working on some things with them, and they were looking for for some new content. Uh, this is probably back in around 2017. And um, I had known 
uh, I had known Nick Garrison from Foolproof, Foolproof Brewing Company uh, through a friend of mine, and, and I know that Nick was doing pretty well. Um, and I knew the beer scene nationally was kind of exploding, but I didn't know too, too much about it. You know, I was casual. I was still drinking Sierra Nevada and Heavy Seas and things like that, uh, which I like a lot, by the way. But uh, I didn't really know how robust the scene was in New England, let alone in Rhode Island. So I pitched the idea. Uh, they asked us to do a pilot, which we then in late 2017 started to do. We put it together. We thought it was pretty good with the understanding that that they would would want us to, you know, they would finance it and then ultimately would end up there. Um, they completely ghosted us uh, after we after we uh, put all that stuff together and put all that work in and uh, basically said that, you know, we should do it for free. And the prize is getting on Rhode Island PBS, which I think is hilarious because we ended up finishing it on our own. And now we're being streamed across the country. So I guess uh, there's a good lesson in, in persistence there and, and, you know, believing that you have a good product, uh, you know, and, and just pushing forth with it. Hard to believe you got ghosted in the media world, huh? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to trash them too, too much, but they were going through some changes. And, I, you know, I, what I will say is, thankfully for us, you know, our agent, um, uh, Therese Linden Cohn of, of Talk Global Media, and then our distribution company, KDMG, again, out in Portland, o Oregon, uh, the, the owner of that, Kyle Kazmarek, um, is a huge, huge craft beer fan. And as soon as he saw, uh, or, or I guess he had known Therese a little bit before that, but as soon as he saw what she was carrying in terms of our movie, he jumped all over it. And, and there were a couple of offers uh, to pick up our movie, but we, we, we talked to Kyle and he was unbelievable and really supportive of the film and, and he had high hopes for it. And so we were just immediately drawn to him. And, you know, I was telling you before as well, Cliff, that, um, you know, because it's called The Craft R.I., both Therese and Kyle see this possibly as, a, as an episodic sort of thing, ultimately, after we get out of Rhode Island, you know, maybe do, do Oregon, do Texas, do North Carolina, Massachusetts, Vermont, you name it. Um, and, you know, we would be thrilled to do that. That would be an awesome platform. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's talk sure. about Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Let's talk. Uh, what drew you to doing this here in Rhode Island? I know you have. I know you have some connections over at Foolproof. Yep. How did you pick which breweries you were going to talk to? Mm -hmm. um, what was that process? Because I know coming from Texas, there are 278 breweries there. Right, it's enormous, and it's a, it's a bloody war down there. They yes. fight for attention. They don't get along with each other. Yeah, there's dividing factions. So now. I go from there to Rhode Island, the small state of Rhode Island, but it's got a booming craft beer scene. So tell me how you kind of took that step towards, all right, I know I want to do this. I know it's a great topic. Mm -hmm. You know, what's next? How did, you, how did that evolve for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> and I'm happy to answer it. Yeah. So like I said, I, I had known Nick Garrison, the owner of Foolproof Brewing Company in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, through a friend of mine growing up, I, I had played hockey and, and he ended up going to school with Nick. And, and that's how uh, he connected me to Nick. So we had one brewery down in, in 2017. Uh, from that point, what I actually did was uh, there was a, a craft beer book that was actually written by um, the, the two ladies that wrote it. The na their names escape me right now, unfortunately. But um, I, I started reading. I read that book and this was that was published maybe in 2015. Um, or 16. And so it was really, really nice to give an overview of kind of what the scene was like at that time. And then, you know, as I said, I was casual, but I had, I, I do know quite a few people around the state through the different things that I'm involved with. Um, and so, you know, you, you hear someone talk about, oh, tilt, you got to go to Tilted Barn, you got to check that out. And uh, one of my professors actually in grad school was like, you got to come, he's actually my friend now, but he's like, you got to come over my house. And I have proclamation. This was like right when they were blowing up. So we had known that we wanted to get, you know, some of those that you know, like Tilted and like Proc, which are both in our movie. Um, we knew we wanted to try to target them. We also knew that we wanted to try to ta target Narragansett because if, you know, if you watch the film, you know, Mark Hellendrung, the, the president of, uh, of Narragansett says, you know, before craft beer, Narragansett was the craft beer back in the day, which is true um, with all their varieties, you know, back in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, that I, I thought that would be a challenge to get Gansett, and I found just the opposite. They were just dying to be in the movie. They gave us all the access we, we could have possibly wanted, and, and, and I can't thank them enough for that. Um, to kind of round it off, the rest of it <coughs> excuse me, was, was kind of a combination of 
uh, some connections, you know, uh, I, I think overall the craft brewers in the state are, are friendly with one another. But as in, in, in life, you know, some people are more friendly with others. So people started putting me in touch with this one and that one. We had a couple of misses, for example. Uh, we would have really liked to have had Long Live uh, Brewery, uh, Brew Works in, in the film. They're in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I, I spoke with Armando on the phone and we just couldn't work out a time to meet. And so we kind of just, that was towards the end of filming too. Um, and then on the other hand, um, we had no intentions of putting Bro Providence Brewing Company or Line Cider Brewing Company, which is partially owned by former Patriot Center Dan Copen, two-time Super Bowl champ. Um, we read in the paper they were opening, this is Line Cider. Um, this was Black Friday of 2018, 2018, I think. And I emailed them and thankfully they got back to me that night. They said, yeah, come on down. And they're like our closest friends now, the guys over at Line Cider. Um, and so to answer your question, I know I'm long winded. Um, it was a, it was a combination of, of planning and then just some luck and timing, you know, that kind of got some breweries into it. And, and then on the other hand, uh, some breweries that we had planned on not making it. Definitely sounds like an opportunity for part two down the road. I, I would think so. You know, you, you mentioned Texas having what, 270 something uh, breweries, you know, that's, that's essentially 10 times what Rhode Island has right now. And um, it, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's some sequels that, that could be had, you know, whether it's out of state or, you know, in the state. We joke now and I probably shouldn't even say this, but I will. Um, you know, a lot has changed in the industry, uh, you know, nationwide, let alone in Rhode Island. And, um, you know, so, so we did, uh, especially during the pandemic with how challenging things are. So we could certainly do, uh, you know, a not so happy version of the craft, considering all the things that have happened, uh, you know, over the last six months or so. Yeah, I've got a funny story as it relates to the pandemic. As you know, I'm over here in the Providence, Pawtucket area, our mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. And I had not tried smug beer mm -hmm. yet. So I went online and I ordered some. And it felt like the old days of prohibition when I went <laughs> to pick it up. You know, you like knock three times on the door and, yeah. and it slides open and they put it through, you know, so it's nice and safe for you to get it. Um, I just laughed the whole walk back. <laughs> Studio. I said that was the most bizarre transaction I've come across. But but isn't that great though? In a way that you know, not just smug, but uh, you know, Revival Brewing Company also in our movie, um, they they had expanded actually to the upstairs in their facility in Cranston. Now they've actually moved out of there and they're moving to Providence too. But it's kind of the same thing that you you literally. I took my brother in law there um, on his birthday, and he was just looking around. He's like, "This is awesome. This is like being in my basement and just like." You know, they had like a like a ski ball uh, machine and, you know, Nintendo 64 or whatever it was. And, you know, you mentioned smug and kind of like, you know, having to knock three times like we're in the Legend of Zelda or something like that. And um, I think that's the charm in, in these these breweries. You know, everybody's got a different take on it, you know, a different space, a different personality. And, you know, you become close to these people and they're, they're, there's so many different experiences out there. You know, they're, they're not cookie cutter. Like you'd be going to Chili's or something like that with all due respect to Chili's. Yeah. All due respect, but <laughs> it isn't Chili's. No, I, it's not Chili's. I went last weekend. Was it last weekend? Yeah. I believe it was last weekend to the guild. Yep. Yep. They're doing their best. Speaking of Narragansett beer, mm -hmm. they're doing their best over there to make it normal. Right. But it's just not. No, it's not. And I'm glad you brought up the Guild and, and the fact that, you know, Gansett was brewing there. Gansett's now opening a new brewery um, at India Point Park in Providence, yep. which right. we're really excited to, to kind of see what those guys can come up with over there. Um, but, you know, the Guild is, uh, you know, we were doc we started the documentary uh, again in 2017. I think we did go to, to Gansett or the Guild in 2017. And at the time, it was totally different than what it is now. And I give those guys all the credit in the world for how awesome they made that spot the beer hall if, if people haven't been you know um the they i think they have the largest tanks or at least american made tanks in maybe the country at least new england um so they've done a great job there and that was always such a, a fun space to go to and they kept expanding and kept expanding and now as you said you know due to the pandemic they're they're trying to make it normal but you know when you only have 25 or 50 percent capacity whatever they have it's it's just not the same you know the, the scene isn't the same without the folks that are um, that are yet they're heading out to these breweries and trying out their beer and, and things like that. And I, I really hope we can get to, you know, back to that soon because, because I miss it. I'm sure you do too. Absolutely. But I'll tell you the one thing that I've gotten out of it is 
I'm more laser focused on supporting these local brewers versus just running into the local liquor store and, get, you know, grabbing, you know, whatever I want from the packy that day. So right. I've almost made it like it's these little trips. Yeah. Whether it's smug um, proclamation. Mm-hmm. Which they're tendril, by the way. That is just an amazing beer. Oh, it's great. It's a classic. Right. Classic. Yeah. So I've kind of developed it. And this is sad to say, but true. Like different nights of the week, I will just plan, okay, this is where I'm going to stop, see what they're like, and I'm going to try something different. Mm-hmm. So I think my palate has gotten broader. I've tried yeah. different kinds of beer. Um, and, and my perfect example is in Texas, they talk a lot about the sour beers because the summer, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although I think 80 degrees is hotter here than 100 degrees is there. <laughs> I think you're right. But I'm not a sour guy. So I was over chatting with the folks that run uh, Trinity Beer Garden. Mm-hmm. And I had a tangerine solstice sour beer. Hmm. It was awesome. Great. Normal circumstances, never would have tried that ever. Yeah. So I'm yeah. just... I'm trying to replace, I guess, being normally social with experimenting mm-hmm. right now. So when we do finally come out of all this stuff, I'll know exactly where to go and get what I want. And I'll have supported the local breweries throughout this crazy time we're going through. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it. It sounds, it sounds like we're, <laughs> we're on the same page with that. Um, you know, my wife and I just moved from Providence down to, I guess, West Kingston, part of South Kingstown. And, um, you know, being in Providence, you're it's not as close <laughs> as we are now to Tilted Barn and Shades On uh, and even Line Cider. And, uh, you know, it's Rhode Island, so you can get there pretty quickly. But, you know, to your point, I what this has also done for me is exactly what you stated. You know, I, I, I don't go to the package stores as much as maybe I used to um, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, doing the film, we're friendly with all these guys now and, and girls, by the way, um, and we want to support them. Um, but also, you know, they their offerings are different uh, at the breweries than they would be, at, you know, in distribution. And so uh, I, too, am not a huge sour guy. My sister and brother in law are. And so whenever I go, I was at Buttonwoods the other day and uh, Morgan had a, a I think a strawberry sour or something like that. And I picked some up for them um, and, and I kept one can for myself. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm, I'm trying to give it a shot because what I can tell you is that I like them more than I used to. Uh, I am, I, I love the New England style IPAs. I love New England doubles and things like that. Um, and, and that was obviously a big kick over the past couple of years. Uh, my palate has kind of shifted towards Pilsner's now, uh, which I enjoy thoroughly, but, um, I think you're exactly right is that, that they're, they're creative and, and their beers are evolving and, and it's kind of forcing us to go out to those breweries to try to support them and then maybe try something new. So I'm all for it. Yeah. It's been a good process. Yeah. Absolutely. For me, anyway, coming from Texas where, I mean, you drive an hour to go to the grocery store. Right. right. You know, once you're outside of the cities, everything's far apart. Mm-hmm. Here, within a mile of me, you've got the Guild. Yep. You've got Smug. You've got all these great things going on. Everything Narragansett Beer did over here. I can't wait for their place to open mm-hmm. over in India Point. I just think the whole tie in with music and craft beer. Uh, and in our case on my show, tailgating is just a perfect fit. It's, it's absolutely a perfect fit. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're like you said, you're over in that Pawtucket uh, Providence area. You know, you, you've also got crooked current, um, which is in the movie. I, one of the only female brewers in the state and, and owners of the brewery, Nicole Pelletier and, and her um, fiance, Jason Laranco, those guys are great. Um, I might actually head up there today, uh, in fact, to go grab some of their blueberry wheat ale, I believe it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're in basically the Rhode Island Mecca of craft beer, you know, up your way. In fact, I think Pawtucket has the most breweries, uh, of any city in the state. Um, and then, like I said, down my way, you know, I'm, I'm within five miles of Tilted Barn, a mile and a half of Shades On, and, you know, maybe eight miles or so of Line Cider. And then Whalers is right down the street too, maybe a 10 minute drive there. Um, so I think we're really, really lucky, um, in, in being in Rhode Island, you know, having, uh, that much variety so close on the other hand, you know, it would be great for the pandemic to end and to get out to Texas and get out to California and, you know, make those, 
those, you know, two or three hour trips, you know, up and down the state to try to, you know, go to some of those breweries that I've never tried before too. It's just a great experience anywhere from Shiner beer, which I kind of look at on the same level as Narragansett beer, only right. Texas. If you're in Texas, Shiner's kind of like having a Budweiser. Right. But when I first walked into a Packy, which they don't call a Packy in Texas, mm-hmm. um, and bought Narragansett beer there, it was $12 for a six pack. Yeah. Yep. And they were raving about it. Yeah. That's so cool that this is translated to what it has and that these local folks have had this opportunity to spread their wings and what better guidance than what Mark has done with Narragansett beer. Mm-hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. No, Mark is a real visionary. You know, he got his start um, at Nantucket Nectars. I believe he was the president of Nantucket Nectars. And, you know, if you watch the film, the craft Rhode Island, um, you know, he, he basically tells the story about how he got, involved with Narragansett beer and, and, you know, just saying there's got to be something else, you know, back in er the early 2000s when there was all the, uh, the big national brands, you know, he, he was looking to, to do something different. And, um, and so he revived Narragansett in 2005 and, and things have just been tremendous. And, and he's made good on his word to bring, you know, the brand back to Rhode Island, bring, you know, most of the brewing back to Rhode Island as well, which is huge. Um, and again, those guys are just, and, and if you, if you know anything about their history, you know, uh, Dr. Seuss did illustrations for them. Um, you know, their their beers featured in Jaws. Uh, they were the first uh, beer sponsor of any professional sports franchise um, with the Boston Braves and then the Boston Red Sox. And n- no one has that history. You know, no, no one has that. It's awesome. amazing. Dave, do I still have you? Yep, yep I'm still here. Yep. <laughs> that went blank for a minute. I, I wasn't sure if I should, should speak up or not. No. But, no, we're good. Okay, cool. Or later on. <laughs> I should know that. We, you know, we, we do some editing here and there, too. Yeah, yeah just a little bit. <laughs> well, my stup- my stupid face takes me five minutes to get, you know, two words right. So it's, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the beauty of editing. I resemble that remark. <laughs> Although for four years on in Texas with a couple hundred thousand people listening, I did learn how to have my own internal 10 second pause. Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, I need to learn that too. <laughs> now I just say, screw it. <laughs> just go for it. Say whatever we want. <laughs> awesome. uh, I, I can, conf- I'm going to confess that I have only watched the trailer of the movie. It is mm-hmm. on my agenda to watch tonight. You sent the link over to me last night, mm-hmm. and um, tendril beer happened, basically. That, uh, that does happen sometimes. I, I forgive you, Cliff. Absolutely. So that is on my uh, target list for this evening. Okay. Um, t- so pretty much anywhere you can stream the movies out there, uh, if I understand correctly, you can pick it up on Amazon. Yep. It locks locally here in Rhode Island. That's right. Uh, Comcast. Comcast. Yep. I don't know. Um, I don't know if Comcast is in Rhode Island. I actually cut all my cable. So I, I watched I, I purchased my own movie on Amazon Prime. Um, but I say Comcast because obviously there's a reach into Massachusetts as well right. uh, with some of the local our, providers. Our listeners are all across New England. Yeah. So I want them to be able to uh, tune in where they're at. For sure. Amazon, Comcast, Cox, uh, Verizon, did I hear you say? Verizon Fios. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Anywhere else you'd like to mention? Yeah, um, we can uh, mention uh, Fandango, um, which is uh, another uh, online streaming service as well. Um, and then, you know, if anyone wants to, if anyone's, you know, across the across the country or wherever, uh, and they want to check out the craftri.com, um, there's a full list of streaming options there. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that um, there is a Blu-ray and DVD available that actually have 25 minutes of bonus footage uh, that's not available if you were to rent it on, you know, Cox or Amazon. Um, and that footage is cool. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a teaser in that um, BJ Mansweti, who is the uh, marketing director of Narragansett, he took us through the guild and, and gave us a, a tour when, when Gansett was canning there. It's about time IPA. Um, you might have some original music from Dave Witham, the owner of Proclamation Ale Company. Uh, on that bonus content as well. And, and I do know that you can pick up the Blu-ray and DVD uh, if you just go to the Amazon 
dot com website and look up the craft ri and scroll to the bottom there's a, a buy option for the dvd and blue as well social media wise let, let's get those handles out there yeah. and of course we'll post everything in, uh for the with us for the show sure um yep so we're on facebook at uh the craft colon ri uh the craft ri and we're really trying to plug our uh instagram handle which is at that craft beer movie at that craft beer movie um, so those are the two that we've really been highlighting. And then on Twitter, you can find us at 11RI, um, our company, 11Design, 11RI on Twitter. Gotcha. Okay, we'll post all those out there for you, listeners. Awesome. In the meantime, Dave, it's been great to have you. I think you owe me a four-pack of beer, uh, and you're going to be up in this neck of the woods, so maybe we should chat uh, offline. I am leaving to uh, to head out uh, up towards Providence in uh, in about a half hour. So I will text you, and I have um, uh, the the second version of the Craft Ri branded beer. This one was done by Foolproof. It's a pineapple IPA, Cliff. So I don't know if you're into pineapple IPAs, but hopefully you will be because I'll drop some off at your house later on. If it's IPA, I'm in. All right, sounds good. All right, buddy. Thanks for it, and we look forward to having you back on as the project uh, grows and grows. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, what a great show. No better way to cook the tailgate here than to talk everything that is tailgating. Uh, On a final note, as we're coming to the end of the recording today, uh, it's the news breaks that the Washington Redskins are yet entangled in another mess. And this one is just disgusting to me. I can't think of any other way to put it. Um, I have some personal connections to the situation and I'm aware of it for a long time and just wasn't as aware as I should be about it. But I hope that the NFL really comes down on this team for the way that they have treated their employees. Um, There's no room for sexual harassment or harassment of any kind in the workplace. So my final kind of thought today, and we'll probably talk about it more next week, is I hope that the NFL can get the Washington team straight because it's obvious that Daniel Snyder has not been able to. Thanks, y'all, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week. I hope that you're digging your feet in the sand somewhere listening to this or sitting on the tailgate or riding your mower, or whatever the case may be. Have a great week and stay safe. Thanks for tuning in. We love having you as part of our tailgate family. Until next time, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at From the Tailgate. Or check out all kinds of cool stuff on our website, from grilling tips to music playlists, sports updates, and more. All at FromTheTailgate.com.